I'm Pete. I work at a company called Fable. Uh, we uh, just have sort of released into the wild an experience called Wolves in the Walls, which is based on a Neil Gaiman and Dave McKeon uh, children's book, which was adapted via Oculus Rift into a virtual reality experience. Um, but I was just going to do a little background on where I came from before that. Um, I spent uh, some time in the visual effects industry, uh, circa 1994 as well, Silicon Studio, SGI, um, back in the day. Um, and then became sort of the West Coast consultant for what ultimately became Maya. Uh, so I pinged all over the West Coast, going into studios, looking at workflows. It was a, kind of an amazing experience, just have a, a backdoor conduit into Pixar and ILM and game studios at the time. And have spent time in feature animation. Um, but the theme here is character and has always been character environments and character, but specifically watching how digital characters have evolved. And then I spent approximately 10 years trudging through the Uncanny Valley across Jackson here uh, at a little studio that was built from scratch to figure out how to make Scrooge there um, using motion capture with Robert Zemeckis. Um, but prior to that, working on Polar Express and really sort of chasing this dream of how do you bring uh, a human performance into a digital character, what are the pitfalls of that? Very exciting, very soul crushing at the same time because you're working so hard to do this and you know it's possible because you get it right in one shot, but then sustaining it over two hours is nearly impossible and then sustaining that across many, many characters becomes even more challenging. And so at the end of this journey, I kind of took a step back and um, popped my head up for air and noticed that all of the things that I had spent the last 20 years or so focusing on were converging around virtual reality. And this was in 2014, Story Studio, Oculus Story Studio had just really put out their first sort of question about what this could be with this project called Lost. And they were working on uh, a movie about a little hedgehog called Henry. And I came into that with big eyes thinking like, this is perfect. This is absolute convergence of everything that I've ever thought about and wanted to work on. And there was this whisper about a project involving this Neil Gaiman piece. And this is Lucy. So this has been the last four years of my life and the last four years of over 100 people's lives trying to bring this little character to life in a way that uh, you believe you're in the same space with her, which is a much much bigger problem than anything I've ever tried to wrap my head around, because it's one thing to make pixels on a screen look convincing, it's another thing to feel like you're in the same space with a character. And so uh, we started by doing something that people have been trying to do for a long time, which is smashing film and game together. You know, Rocket Science was trying to do this in 1996, um, and we've seen lots of examples of how challenging this can be. And, for the first time, we felt like we actually had all the tools because the real-time engines were there, and we started to understand with longer-form narrative gaming like what some of those challenges might be. We, we put the right people in the room together, but it wasn't too long. It was about six months before we just came to a complete stalemate. We had people from Pixar and ILM who were absolutely convinced about how you did things, and we had people from 2K and you know, all of these amazing game companies that knew exactly how you created a game and we couldn't agree on how to solve some of the things that weren't working in terms of interactivity and narrative and how do you balance those two. And then we found a third point in our compass which was immersive theater. And this is kind of a trope now, like this is, gets talked about a lot, but this was something that we didn't understand when the immersive theater world came in to our world when we went to see really good immersive theater. First of all, we walked out of you know, a couple experiences just saying like everything has changed. That's what we want to create. We just want to do it in a distributed way. We want to do it so that the whole world can experience this. But when they came to us and said, well, what's your, you know, your major dramatic question? We just stood back and said, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know that language. I, I know what my catalyst is. And the, uh, you know, the game, my game counterpart was like, well, I know what my prototyping goal is, but I don't even know what you're talking about. And so we had to sort of rethink. And the, what happened is the film people and the game people no longer were at each other's throats. They were 
looking towards a unattainable thing, which was the ability to improvise. And which that was the, the, the thing that was so enviable about what an immersive theater performer could do is in the moment, in an intimate setting, when you're with one other person locked in a closet, that's a human that can weave a story and adapt to your choices. And so that's what we started to strive towards. And now having done this, um, at least attempting to have done it, we're gonna collapse all that into sort of what we know. And this is gonna get a little Rumsfeldian. and I always have to apologize by this. But um, so we think we have a pretty good understanding now of how to balance those th three things, right? We know interactivity from games and we've learned a lot about prototyping culture and we know how to tell a good story from film and what makes a character appealing. And we know now there's lots of things we can take from theater to balance those two things. And what we don't know about or we're just starting to learn about is how do we inject technology into this equation? So what does machine learning look like in this scenario? What does natural language processing look like in this scenario? Uh, what do adversarial networks give us? And really it's all at the service of what can we know about our audience? What can we know about our character so that we can adapt and tell stories in a much more compelling and personal way? And then we know probably in the next year we are gonna hit a stalemate again and we have to find a third. It's already actually starting to happen because we come into these spaces so confident in our own abilities because we've successfully done something and the ML people too, they're like, this is how you do this. This isn't how you, you know, you're just creative people, we're technicians. You know, it's a story we've heard since we first tried to put pixels on the screen too. You get to a place where you're just set in your ways and you need to find a new heading in order to merge those ideas. And so I would say within the next six months, we're gonna have to find this third compass heading. And then of course, this collapses into what we think is the ultimate goal. Uh, my co-founder, Edward Saatchi, is a huge Next Generation fan. So we call this California, if it's a gold rush metaphor, or the holodeck. Um, but this is what we ultimately think this experience will be. You walk into a space, it's indistinguishable from reality. The performances are indistinguishable from reality, and they adapt to you. And then probably, almost certainly, a breadcrumb on another path. So, this is where we started with Lucy. The first pillar and the first priority was connecting to a character. We didn't really know what that meant, but the more we spent time with her, the more we wanted to feel connected to her, the more we wanted to engage with her. Um, we spent about six months failing to balance interactivity with narrative, and then we stumbled across this idea that things that were natural and intuitive, like just flipping on a light switch or lighting up her path with a a flashlight or brushing a cobweb out of the way so you could see better. Those were the types of interactions that actually connected you to the character, connected you to the narrative, and so we made rules about what kind of interactions are actually at the service of this type of experience and what things are novelties. Because virtual reality, it's new, just like CG when it came in. You know, the chrome ball over the checkerboard we all thought was really cool in 1991 because it was ray tracing and we'd never seen anything like that but now it's a trope, and almost all of the things that we think are cool about VR right now are cool because they're novel. There's no reason we're fascinated by picking up a flashlight in real life after we're three, <laughs> but in virtual reality, that's a really cool thing to do still, and so what, what and when do we start to let go of the novelty, and what is truly meaningful to storytelling, truly meaningful to character interaction? Casting the audience putting you in a space, especially in a six degree of freedom experience where you can move around, you can lay on the floor, you can turn around and not look at a main character, means that we have to really think about who you are in that experience. Not as relative, uh, relevant if you're in observer mode, if you're in a 360 degree screen essentially, it's okay for you to be passive, but if you're there and the character's making eye contact with you, it's really important that we understand who you are to these characters, who you are in the experience. So these are, sort of the big guiding pillars of what created Lucy. And we thought it was about creating a character in virtual reality when we started. That was essentially our goal because the people paying for it initially were Oculus. They wanted to prove to Hollywood that it wasn't just games for VR, there was also stories that could be told in VR and that was kind of our mission. But what we found out is that when the audience went through it, they were saying something very different. They were saying, man, I felt like a kid or I just felt like I was going along for a ride, or I was in her world, 
or I felt connected to her. And so about that same time, we started saying, okay, well, maybe this isn't about virtual reality movies. Maybe this isn't a new medium. Maybe it's about character. Maybe that's what, what's really interesting about what we're doing. And just like John was talking about and several other speakers today, putting a character like this up on any type of screen is incredibly difficult and requires this invisible army of people to create her. But it also involves you know, choreographers. You know, her embodiment is a motion-captured ballet dancer. Her voice is an eight-year-old girl. Um, she came out of Neil's imagination. Um, we have people writing. We have people creating textures. And then we have all the engineers that are creating her proceduralized systems. So you know, she has four or five sort of pseudo AI or proceduralized systems that manage her body language, manage her eye contact, all those things obey social convention. We're measuring your curiosity. We're measuring your intention. We know through a combinatorial sort of array of are you looking at her? Do you have an object in your hand? Does that object have an emotional significance to her? Do, uh, do you have a motion that's going to reach for something? All of those things are being sampled so that we can determine what's your intention. And if your intention is, I want to grab this object, she might wait just a little bit longer for you to grab that. And all of that is at the avoidance of what we used to call Uncanny Valley, we still call Uncanny Valley. What I'm proposing is uh, the chasm of inconsistency. <laughs> Having gone through this process many times, both visually and now emotionally, I think where we catch ourselves, where we get distracted is when one thing isn't at the fidelity of another. And so we might be able to ray trace an eye reflection, but our subsurface scattering in our skin circa 2002 wasn't up to snuff. Our ambient occlusion wasn't quite there yet. Our hair simulation wasn't quite there yet. And we are so good at thin slicing all of those inconsistencies that you have to have a lowest common denominator. And now when we're adding in interactivity and timing, We've all played that video game where the character's doing this, waiting for you to do the thing, right? And then you grab it, and then they go. And that was one of the things that I would constantly be harping on in dailies. If we ever have that moment where we grab something and she's waiting there, and then does the thing, we break presence. We have an inconsistency, we have an uncanniness. And it's, so now we have to worry about that in its pacing and its reactivity. We have to worry about it emotionally. John's talking about embodiment and is that performer coming through? Is this Lucy? You know, our animators focus on what her eye shape is constantly because that's what defines Lucy's appeal. But if her voice isn't working at the same time, if her body movement isn't in sync, and if you take a picture of her and she doesn't notice, it's dissatisfying, right? It breaks presence. And so, there's interrupt systems in there where she can stop and then resume, We're like, oh yeah, what was I doing? So it all feels natural and fluid, but right now it takes an army. And this is where AI is particularly attractive to us because we can't support and sustain this for as long as we've done. It took us you know, over a year just to do one scene where you have many, many options of interruption. I'm gonna repeat this quote that I saw earlier mostly because it's an awesome quote, but this was kind of an epiphany for me because again, my co-founder Edward will say these incredibly provocative things that um, for those of us who have to implement things, you know, it, it becomes sort of an immediate rejection. So the one he said to me, now it's been a year, is that you know, a character will be the next operating system. And you can Google that and there's an article about it. And I rejected it immediately because you know, I don't like to think of a character as an operating system. But after we got through the process of creating Lucy, and I could calm down a little bit and really think about, well, what would happen if we were to create a character that could represent an interface layer to data, just from a very vague standpoint, how would we even go about that? What would that mean? And it, it's, it's something that almost every time I talk about any of these concepts to people, there's a rejection layer, there's this barrier of like, we can't accept this possibility, whether it's a dystopian future, and I love Protopian, that's stealing that like immediately, but I have to fight the dystopian future that we have portrayed in Hollywood 
and we continually portray of like the worst case scenario of this technology. It's the thing I have to do in every panel and every discussion. But all of these things are inevitable in my mind. This is an inevitability. This is happening. And so we are responsible for guiding it. Um, and so this quote combined with Edward saying a provocative thing sort of gave me this. So I, I had to take a step back and just say, OK, forget about the implications for a second. What if you could do this? How would you do it? And I needed to stop and look at what was going on for just a second. Uh, so I took a look at all the things that I had grown up with. First, take a look at film. And probably my first love, it's high friction. You know, we have to buy a ticket. We have to get there early. We have to make plans. We're doing this less and less often, unfortunately. It's got traditionally a three-act structure. Average animated features, 88 minutes. You can get things past 188 minutes. But most importantly, that's about as much time as you get to spend with a character. Uh, it can be semi-controlled environment. It's generally a high-quality experience, but it's a passive experience. And for the most part, this medium has no awareness of its audience. With games, we have this medium friction. Um, you might need a PC or a console, so it's not just coming to your phone. I know there's mobile gaming, but I'm talking about that premium experience. You could have any number of formats, but you could have up to 60 hours of a character. There's this wide range of quality, so you're not exactly sure what you're going to get. In fact, most people never complete the games they buy, yet they use the length of a game to decide whether they're going to buy it or not, which is also a strange behavior. It's an active experience, but typically you embody the character that you're playing. Right? So this is very different than film. You're not experiencing someone else's story and comparing yourself to that. Would I do that in this situation? Am I the villain? Am I the hero? You have agency, but you're not using that mirror that we have in film. Now, of course, we're in the golden age of this. Uh, extremely low friction. It comes to you. You can binge it. Um, in the premium experiences, now you're getting 40 to 60 hours of a character. This is profoundly changing how the audience feels about ownership over these characters. I think Game of Thrones was really eye-opening in terms of how people felt like they had ownership over the story and the characters. You, know, you spend so much time understanding who these characters are, who is Arya Stark, how does she behave, and then when she does something unexpected, you are really affected by it, right? <laughs> And then sometimes you feel betrayed by it because that's not what you expected. That's what started to get me to think, whoa, what's, what is that next step? So these are passive experiences. Again, they're extremely high quality now. And there is a feedback loop with the audience. I'll never forget the message boards on Twin Peaks where there was a very small group of us like commenting on this stuff. And then an episode showed up where you know, the message board influenced the content. And it was like, we have agency here. This will change things. <laughs> Lost another show that, you know, what the hell is that polar bear doing? And then all of a sudden, you see like a little thread come off because the audience is reacting. It's not in real time, but it had power because you had agency. So here's what I think the future is. A character that you could spend 20 years with. One that could learn and grow with you. One that's aware of you. One that can remember you. Um, Sorry, let me go back to that. So my co-creator, Jessica, she was 10 when Harry Potter came to the US. And Harry was 11, right? And then the next year, she got the next book, and Harry was 12. And Hermione was 12. And so a fact that over the course of seven and a half years, a character was growing up with her and having that relevance and same situations allowed her to bond with these characters in ways that I couldn't. I still totally enjoy that experience, but for her, it's profound, right? Because you have these like identities that are actually aging up with you. So I also wanted to take a look at who we are as consumers. I grew up in this generation. We're currently in this generation, and I think this is where we're headed. So we, in the 80s, you know, we loved material objects. We had advertising-driven brand awareness. This still is in our culture, but not nearly as much. You know, people would walk around with t-shirts that had this printed on that, and that was cool. <laughs> right? Now we're in 
this experiences generation. We have these Instagrammable moments. We have the selfie everywhere. We have location-based entertainment. With all of these examples, we take pictures of our food, of our travel, of the events we're at, and we share them because we want to be seen. We want to be seen doing something that has merit or is seen to enrich our lives. And we value the accumulation of experience. So I don't want to be too dystopian here, I'm trying to remind myself to be positive. These things also helped us connect and make sense of a shrinking world. You know, the amount of things that Facebook give us, you know, how many of you would know the Amazon was on fire if you didn't have Facebook? We just didn't pay attention to this stuff. And so the world was a little bit easier to understand. And there's this amazing show called Civilizations. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's PBS and it's on Netflix about how art and civilization are intrinsically linked. And one of the episodes is on photography. And they talk about people who were introduced to the camera in the late 1800s. And all of the things they said were exactly the things we complain about now, which is, if I take a picture of something, I'm never going to visit there. It's shrinking the world. There's no sense of identity anymore. So there's always been this intrinsic fear of technology. And yet, it's inevitable we are going to do it. So how do we shape it in a way that we feel positive about it? I think this is where we're headed. So we're going to crave these tailored experiences. And immersive theater absolutely delivers this. But 1% of 1% is ever going to experience it. It's expensive. It's hard to get to. You've got to fly to New York. You've got to go to Brooklyn. You've got to spend $250. There's 12 people that go through that experience a night. But I was in a closet combing a, a woman's hair <laughs> while she asked me about the first time I was in love. Right? That's a profound experience. But you cannot scale that. So how do we scale it? And I think, personally, we all want to be seen. You know, whether we want to be seen for who we are, we want to be recognized. We want to make that eye contact. We want to have those moments. So these catered custom experiences that can be shared either after the fact or in real time with our friends, that they are reciprocal. They are two-way. These aren't, you know, this isn't selfishness. This is about spending time with someone, that they're personal and that they are worthy of forming memory. The character is the content. So these characters that spend lots of time with us, that learn and grow, that share these experiences, and that adapt and deliver unique and personalized content. And they will ultimately recognize us and remember who we are. Uh, once we've done that, we've actually extracted the character from the nar narrative. So we also have to have a way of making you feel like you have an impact on the story but not complete control over the story. So a game right now, you are that main character. You, we want you to feel like you have agency. But in a, a narrative like Wolves, we didn't want you to be the main character. We wanted Lucy to be the main character. So I'm coining this the braided narrative. I'm not sure if I'm the first one to talk about this, but people talk about a branching narrative. And this is much more accurate to what we did. So when, when the audience is asked, they claim that they want Choose Your Own Adventure. I think what they actually crave is uh, a path to be taken on a journey. They want a dungeon master, which my 44-year-old self is like gleefully smiling now <laughs> that D&D is cool, uh, because it certainly wasn't when I was playing it. But there was magic that was happening when you had a really good storyteller giving you the ability to make choices but also taking you on a, on a journey. And when we were talking earlier about what is the future of this and where is the competitive advantage, it's going to be here. If you are a great storyteller and can still be confident enough to give some of the storytelling power to the audience and know that you're there holistically to create this amazing experience, we will have sort of leveled up this, this, uh, this industry. So this is uh, a little example of this. Um, Hopefully this plays. Maybe it won't. I'll, I'll skip it because it's going to take too long to download. Um, so it's basically a video showing that as you're interacting with Lucy, the moment you take a picture, it splits into four options. Uh, 
And then when you decide to take the picture out and show it to her, it splits into 16 options because now you could throw that picture on the ground, you could look at it, you could take another one, you could hand it to her. And then um, if you never brought the camera up in the first place, now we have 32 combinatorial effects. And so there's this, in essence, you have agency over the story, you have your choices matter, they impact it. In this case, we're creating the inciting incident of the film by getting proof of a wolf which then sends Lucy on her journey to try and convince her family that there are wolves living in the walls of her house. But ultimately, all of that comes back to a single point where she grabs the photo from you, examines it, and says, oh, there are wolves, and then hands you a magnifying glass so that you can see. And the moment you decide to pick that, we branch again. But we're always coming back to the main trunk of the story because that's the experience we want you to have. We call that the golden path. Yet, your choices matter. The things that you do have impact, and they're specific to you, and she has a memory of them. She's aware of those things. And so that way, you can participate in this story, but it's not your story. It's her story. So again, we're proposing that character and narrative are actually essentially going to separate in the future. And that's incredibly scary to a storyteller, because everything we do to craft a story is intrinsically lock those two things. We worry about three-act structure, we th worry about scene arc, we worry about emotional change over a moment, and how do you disconnect and decouple those two? And so we're starting to work at Fable on abstracting those concepts into models that help us understand how we're going to manage that, how we're gonna build these character relationships over time in ways that transcend traditional forms of entertainment and so I call this the harmony of engaging activities. We sort of see four ways that you potentially could interact with a character. Play, this could be watching a movie together, this could be playing a game together. Uh, we can learn from each other, we can teach, we can connect to one another and other people, and we can have assistance. And whenever you start to overlap these two things, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this all stems off this maybe Japanese concept called ikigai, which is this harmony and balance of life. Um, and we're using that as a model to define a virtual being. So when you are playing and assisting together, you might have a data farm like SETI where you're you know, doing research by playing a game or play to cure, which is this amazing game that helps cancer research. So it's essentially building a data farm. If you're playing and teaching together at the same time, we have edu edutainment. It's essentially what Sesame Street is. Uh, if you're connecting and teaching together, we have ultimately what the goal of diversity is, which is like what an exchange student might be. Or assisting and connect, Rotten Tomatoes is an example of this. Crowdsourcing, taste, right? But when you do all of those things together, I think you have this really magical sort of new format where a, a character can come in, in and out of a story, it can remember everything you've ever done with it, we have a relationship together, it remembers whether you're afraid of spiders, or the headline that was recently was whether you hate cilantro or not, and can sort of live as this friend, character, narrative, always coming in and out of your life in various forms. It doesn't always have to be a visual embodiment. It doesn't have to be that premium experience of virtual reality. Um, but it can always be there, and it will know who you are. And the last thing I want to talk about is memory, because I think the the most important part of this is memory. So I'm not gonna play this, I'll just describe it because I don't think it will play. Um, I was listening to Radio Lab and this clip came up and if you Google transient global amnesia, you'll be able to watch it for yourself. This is a woman from Sacramento. She was gardening and she kind of lost her sense of time and, and place and she called her daughter and her daughter answered the phone and her daughter thought she had had a stroke. She basically said, Mom, you gotta go to the hospital. I'll meet you there. She drives from San Francisco, gets to the hospital. Mom's already in the, in the room. And the doctor comes out and says, I don't want you to worry. Your mom has transient global amnesia. It'll probably last 24 hours. But right now, she can only remember uh, about 60 seconds. And so she goes in, and she starts talking to her mom. And her mom says, what day is it? It's Tuesday. I missed my birthday? No, you were there. We were all there. We had a great time. What happened? Well, you called me on the phone, and then the paramedics came and got you. What day is it? It's Tuesday. Oh, I missed my birthday? 
And it's not that she was just repeating those words. Her inflection is the same. Her pupil dilation is the same. The cadence of her speech is the same. And that's scary and terrifying for all of us humans who think that we have sort of agency and we're not robots, right? What this tells me is that memory is the thing that differentiates us from Lucy, right? Because when that woman is saying those things in that repetitive way, and all of the inflections are the same, and the cadence of her voice is the same, we're doing that right now in Unreal Engine with Lucy. Stimulus response, right? You can do four or five things. As soon as you do that one thing, we fire this new tree, and then you get a different response. In fact, we could make Lucy do that exact thing. It's Tuesday, what day is it? Give you a speech, we can do it with speech recognition. But it's the woman's memories that over the course of an hour, she started remembering more on both sides. She started remembering more about her identity. She started remembering more about the day and all of the context. And all of a sudden, her human behavioral characteristics change. She becomes much more reciprocal. She becomes much more responsive. She becomes much more emotional and empathetic. And so that tells me that we can start tapping into a layer of memory with these characters. That's the next level of fidelity. That's what gets us out of that chasm of inconsistency. So I will leave it at that. I'm probably way over time. But uh, yeah, any questions?